afternoon and uh, welcome everybody to the first focus panel of this festival here in the exhibition hall. My name is Inga Seidler and I'm the curator of this year's Transmediale exhibition program and I'm happy to announce um, the panel Calculating Life with Heather Dewey Hackborg and Charles Heller of Forensic Oceanography. Um, Calculating Life brings together two artists of the exhibition program who work with forensic methods and digital technologies and they will talk about how these can be utilized and also repurposed to reveal and resist the mechanisms by which life itself becomes a subject of securitization. And this in the context of militarized border regimes and DNA profiling. The panel is moderated by Eric Snodgrass. Eric is a senior um, lecturer at the Department of Design at Linnaeus University in Sweden and his research looks into the intersections of media, politics and technology with a focus on the issues of materiality, infrastructures of power and forms of interventions. Eric's recent works um, includes the co-edited volume Executing Practices and uh, a PhD dissertation Executions, Power and Expression in Networked and Computational Media. And with this brief introduction, I handing over to um, Eric Snodgrass and the panelists. Hello, thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce you to this panel, which uh, was titled Calculating Life. Um, and we have uh, two of the artists for the Territories of Complicity exhibition, Heather Dewey Hogborg and Charles Heller from Forensic Oceanography. Um, before we start, I think we'd just like to quickly thank uh, the curator, Inga Seidler, uh, festival curator, Daphne Dragone, Christopher Gansen, and everyone involved in Transmediala. Um, who brought us together and brought these artists in the exhibition together under this, what I would say is a really important context um, of, as the statement for Territories of Complicity puts it, exploring practices that employ forensic methods, speculative approaches, appropriation, and experimentation in order to question today's dominant political narratives and challenge our notions of value and belonging. Uh, our particular panel has been framed under a rubric of calculating life, um, and I was just asked to give a short introduction on this um, to um, some things we might think about. Uh, the statement for the panel speaks of things such as surveillance, biometric governance, and high-tech securitization. Of course, these are, uh, these are not new things, and indeed, given how thoroughly they've inserted them into uh, both kind of extreme instances of living, but also everyday living, uh, I guess uh, if you heard, uh, if someone said you're gonna be on a panel of calculating life, I, I imagine many of us could just kind of intuitively maybe th understand what that means, um, given where we are today. Um, uh, there's also, uh, um, I, th I think more recently, the question of whose lives are being monitored, whose lives are being subject to calculation, um, the distribution of valuations of certain lives more than others has become something that's pushed itself into general discourse today. So I, I think that makes this, uh, that also relates to these, these panelists. Um, Wendy Chun has, uh, the, the writer Wendy Chun has talked about that we are all characters in the big drama, uh, the drama of big data, as she says it, but I think it's important that we think about how we are not all given access to just any role or any kind of life within that drama. Mm. Uh, these technological systems, and more importantly, the economic, political, and historical orientations that drive them are not brought about in some kind of neutral, unbiased, um, evenly applied way. I think that's gonna be very clear in the presentations. Uh, of course, they're not. Um, in one case after another, the potential that always lies in creative pursuits with technology, which Transmedia has always explored, um, uh, those potentials are, uh, we, we find them again and again directed towards uh, kind of older energies, predictable energies of domination and control. Um, Chelsea Manning, who's gonna feature in, uh, we might have seen in the exhibition in, in Heather's work, um, he gives the example in a recent interview of uh, the, all the um, kind of data mining software and the software used for predictive analysis. It was actually just based on uh, software used for, I think he said it was marketing and, and ads. 
And so these kind of trajectories that uh, we see technology um, um, taking one <laughs> year by year, um, I guess we could say they're not surprising anymore. Um, we should take them at face value. Uh, the history and present of technology has proven again and again to almost always be capitalist friendly, obsessed with surveillance, power and control, just it is also again and again so easily infused with racialized, gendered, queer unfriendly, migrant hostile and other forms of segregating and disempowering energies. This is the face value of the present and as we see in, 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 in the works here and the practices, um, this is how it is. It is, you know, this is technology today. Um, and, and thankfully, helpfully, the works and practices of both artists here today are well acquainted with these forces and these modes of calculating life, um, which is why it's so fantastic to have them here. Uh, in both cases, they address issues such as, um, but in addition to that, in addition to speaking of how everything's being calculated, monitored, surveilled, um, they also um, give us examples of practices of pushing back um, and doing so in ways that seek to directly engage publics um, uh, and also to um, engage people with these tools and practices of what we might call resistance, um, using techniques such as forensics, reverse engineering, user-friendly DIY toolkits, um, and things like infrastructure building, as well as artistic and aesthetic modes of inquiry and engagement, they bring to life alternative ways of living and being in the world. <clears throat> Perhaps most importantly, they work to directly promote and sustain forms of solidarity that point towards other forms of living. Um, just to move over to a quick introduction of our panelists, um, uh, I would first like to introduce Heather Dewey Hogborg, who's gonna start us tonight. Um, Heather has been internationally recognized at events and venues, uh, including, amongst others, World Economic Forum, Shenzhen Urbanism and Architecture Biennale, the New Museum, PS1 MoMA, and her works have also been acquired into collections uh, uh, at Centre Pompidou, the Van Abba Museum, uh, New York Historical Society, and elsewhere. Um, she's also, interestingly, been widely discussed within the media, um, from the New York Times and the BBC, Ted Wired, so um, there's an interesting crossover that's happened there. Um, for several years now, Dewey Hogborg has been developing a biopolitical, biopolitical art practice that works to make public both the latest techniques in biology and the relation to our understandings of things like identity, which we see in this e exhibition very clearly, the traces we leave in the world, and the multiple rather than seemingly singular way in which practices and understanding around DNA can be interpreted. In works like the DNA-derived portraits, Dewey Hogborg works to engage people with the ability to take control of discourses and practices around identity construction and the role in the societal moment. Here at Transmediala, we have um, her guest exhibition, which is called, uh, really intriguingly, A Becoming Resemblance, and its centerpiece, probably Chelsea, a series of 30 3D printed possible portraits of Chelsea Manning, the former uh, a U.S. intelligence analyst who turned whistleblower in 2013 and was sentenced to um, imprisonment. Um, this was done partly as a risk, well, I'll, I think I'll let Heather speak about that. Uh, and next to me here we have Charles Heller, um, who is one half of the uh, forensic uh, oceanography team. Um, he also works with his collaborator Lorenzo uh, Pezzani, who uh, regrettably uh, couldn't make it uh, in the end. Um, Heller has worked as a researcher and filmmaker um, whose work has a long-standing focus on politics of migration. He completed his PhD uh, th dissertation in 2015 at Goldsmiths. Um, this thesis offers an account of Heller's trajectory as a researcher and aesthetic practitioner, uh, particularly seeking to document and contest the violence of migration regimes operating between Europe and Africa. Um, Heller and Pazina are also very closely uh, associated with forensic uh, architecture, another very uh, uh, important um, collaborative uh, group. So uh, just to summarize, in speaking of calculating life, I think we have in this panel commentaries on modes of calculation, but really importantly also um, powerful examples of uh, various contemporary um, uh, people, technologies holding power to account at a time when many are simply attempting to, for instance, blame the rescuers, blame the whistleblowers, um, blame these many other willful voices uh, that we thankfully have today, um, uh, uh, and so on. And beyond this, um, they also give us practices that point towards other forms of being, of life, and practices working with new, creating new infrastructures, new collectives, and roadmaps for resistance and solidarity. 
um, whether at the molecular level, at the technological level, at the transnational level. Um, thank you, Heather and Charles, for coming here. We're uh, really excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much for the nice introduction and for having me here at Transmediale. Um, I first got to know Chelsea Manning by reading her DNA. So long before I met her in person, long before I ever received any kind of message from her or letter, I received an envelope with her hair clippings and cheek swabs, which I extracted DNA from and analyzed to generate portraits of her. This was something that I'd been working on for a while. So starting in 2012, I began a body of work called Stranger Visions, where I would walk around the streets of New York and collect things like cigarette butts and bits of chewed up gum, hairs and fingernails that people had discarded. And I would extract DNA from those in a community laboratory. The first ever community laboratory had recently opened in downtown Brooklyn called Genspace. And I had signed up and taken this crash course there and learned how to do basic DNA work. And I began analyzing these uh, bits of genetic artifacts from strangers and interpreting that data, bringing that into custom software that I wrote which would generate a 3D representation of what that person might look like based on genomic research. Uh, I would gen generally generate a handful of different versions of a person's face. Is it possible to get the sound turned down in the exhibition? It's a bit distracting. Um, I would generate a handful of different versions of a person's face, maybe five to ten different possible faces, and then I would choose the one that spoke to me the most. I would choose the one that, I, that resonated with me when I looked at it. And this work at this time was meant to call attention. I mean, first and foremost, it came from this realization that we were shedding these kind of bits of ourselves all the time without giving it a second thought, that there was this messy physicalness to the body that was being ignored. And we were having conversations, and this was still pre-Snowden, but we were having conversations about cameras on the streets and uh, wiretapping and our electronic data practices, but we weren't talking at all about this physical body. And this kind of realization hit me, and I wanted to make work that would call attention to this particular vulnerability that I thought was being overlooked. And as I dug into that research, I found that there was this emerging technology that hadn't um, materialized yet of forensic phenotyping, so of efforts to actually create pictures of people based on DNA alone. And while there hadn't really been anything that had come out publicly about that yet, I could see that it would be coming in the future. And so I wanted to call attention to that as well. So this was 2012, 2013. And then in 2014, this happened. So this is a picture that a friend's mother sent me um, that she saw in her local newspaper in Western Massachusetts. This is real. I mean, this is really um, a so-called DNA snapshot portrait of a suspect based on DNA left at a crime scene. And so the company that launched that offers this service is called uh, Parabon Nanolabs. And these are all actual police investigations. So this is real stuff that has been put out in the world. Um, and what I think you can see, as, as you see me <laughs> scrolling through all these faces, is that they're incredibly generic. I mean, it's basically the same basic face, I mean, with a couple exceptions, the same basic face with differences in skin color and eye color and then hair. But the face itself remains almost identical across the faces. And so the point is that really, this is a field in which there's no regulation there's no oversight. There isn't even any kind of agreement about what accuracy would mean in terms of a technology like this or a conversation around how that could be considered. And so for me, when this happened, it really shifted 
my feelings about my own work away from feeling like I needed to call attention to something speculative that was coming towards realizing I needed to work much harder to problematize the existing technology that was now out there in the world. Um, and in particular, to call attention to the uh, political issues around putting this very ambiguous profiling technology into the hands of police and how easily this can become a new form of racial profiling. So I was thinking about this and I started writing about this, so I published an essay called Sci-Fi Crime Drama with a Strong Black Lead that's on exactly this subject and I would start talking about this in my talks and things, but it wasn't clear to me yet how to bring that into, the, into my work, how to make that kind of self-reflexive turn in the work itself. And then in July of 2015, I received this email. So this uh, paper magazine was conducting an interview with Chelsea Manning through the mail. And at this point, she was uh, in military prison and subject to this very harsh policy of visitation. So she could only be visited by her family, her lawyers, and people who'd known her before she was imprisoned, before she was in the military. And no one could, no journalists could visit her, no photographers could come. And so what that meant is that since her sentencing in 2013, and at, at the same time since her announcement of her gender transition in 2013, her image had been completely suppressed. So in effect, there were no images of Chelsea Manning available at all. She'd, been, she'd had her face literally censored. And so when I received this request to create a portrait of her from her DNA, of course I immediately would say yes. I mean, I would say yes regardless because I admired her so much, her bravery, and um, I really looked up to her. But I realized also, so the first thing that Chelsea said, she was excited about the idea of, of creating a DNA portrait and the potential of being given this face, but she was concerned that because of her genetic sex that she might appear too masculine. And so I realized in having this conversation that this was the perfect way to start calling attention to some of the limitations of the technology in the piece itself. And so it kind of came at this perfect moment to start putting these things together. And so the next time that Chelsea was getting her hair cut, she snatched up some of the clippings from the floor and then she took a couple uh, Q-tips and swabbed the insides of her cheeks, gave them to her lawyer who then was able to mail them to me. And I extracted the DNA and sent it for sequencing and I went through really all of the same processes that I'd gone through with Stranger Visions with this one crucial difference that I decided to leave the profiling of genetic sex out altogether. So we essentially deemed it not worthy of analyzing. And then I created uh, two versions of her portrait based on that DNA. So this is where this, the, if you ha have been to the exhibition of, of Becoming Resemblance Outside, you'll see where that goes. Um, so to begin with, I created these two versions of her portrait. So on your left, you can see this androgynous version, this one with the gender parameter completely left out of the algorithmic uh, software. And then on the right, you can see this parameterized female version. And so my hope with this was that by putting these two faces side by side, it would start to call attention to some of the shortcomings and um, reductionism and biases and really question what a female face, what the idea of a female face might even mean, this kind of stereotyping around faces, which is, I mean, really present in all kinds of facial recognition technology and in all um, of these kind of machine learning models that relate to faces. So the digital versions of these portraits uh, were printed alongside the interview, and then the 3D prints actually premiered for the first time at the World Economic Forum in 2016, which was I think really an amazing and poignant place, I mean, to put her face, this face that had been censored in front of the most elite and inaccessible people in the world. So then we began to correspond <laughs> and write letters and um, I was concerned first um, of what to do with her DNA. You know, I had all of her DNA sitting there and I thought, what, should I destroy it? I mean, should I archive it? Should I try to, to give it to her? 
And uh, so I wrote to her and asked what I could do with her DNA, and she said, um, Every way, the police, the state already has all my DNA. I mean, don't worry about it, but please don't send it to me. <laughs> and, um, and then I wanted to send her pictures also so she could see how the uh, imaging had come and she could respond to that also and asked if that was okay. And so we began this kind of uh, correspondence uh, and uh, which led into then also thinking about doing future work together and where that could evolve and what we should do with the portraits, where they should be uh, installed, who should see them, who, who the audience is, these kinds of questions. Um, but this also was a moment of reflection for me where I realized there's a crucial difference between working with this kind of stack of anonymous strangers' samples and working with this one person's DNA where it becomes, it shifts and becomes this really intimate act that suddenly you're sitting there with one person's cells, with one person's data, and you're kind of pouring over it and sifting through it and thinking about them all the time and knowing them in this weird way that they might not know themselves. I mean, they don't know this genetic information about themselves, most likely. And so suddenly I realized that it had become this intimate, like strangely intimate process. And then it continues. So uh, in November of 2016, Obama's exit from the White House was approaching, and it was very clear that um, this was the last chance for a while for um, petitions for clemency for Chelsea Manning. And so I wanted to help in some way to work on her clemency campaign. And uh, I was approached by an illustrator, Shirley Canungo, um, who wanted to work with me on something and I sort of put these pieces together and um, Chelsea and I together wrote this short graphic story, um, suppressed images, and Shoyley illustrated it. And so the uh, comic goes over this whole story that I've been narrating to you today uh, in a kind of abbreviated form. Uh, it's written as a dialogue between Chelsea and I and draws on our actual letters and communications and messages um, and narrates this process of, that we had of working together. And you can see um, this image on your right is in the exhibition also as a poster size one. And in the gift shop, <laughs> you can buy an edition version of that that's signed by both Chelsea and myself as well. And so the comic crucially, ends with this last frame that was a speculative twist. So this was the kind of activist, um, the most activist aspect of it that we would anticipate um, or sort of call for or invoke even um, Obama to commute Chelsea's sentence and then imagine that she's free and she's able to come and see an exhibition of her portraits in person for the first time. And so the, the really incredible and overwhelmingly powerful thing that happened was that we published this on the morning of January 17th, January 17th, and that afternoon Obama did actually commute Chelsea's sentence in really the most emotionally significant moment of certainly my artistic career. And then on August 5th, it came true. So Chelsea was freed in May, and we had an exhibition together that opened at the end, uh, that opened in August, and on August 5th, she was able to come to the opening and see her portraits in person for the first time. So this is probably Chelsea, which you can see. This is the main piece that's in the exhibition outside. Um, when it was announced that she would be released and we had the opportunity to have this exhibition at Friedman Gallery in New York. Suddenly we had a thousand square feet of space and an opportunity to do something with that. I mean, keep in mind we had just these two little portraits <laughs> at the time. And so on the one hand, of course, we have to fill the space. But on the other hand, we really wanted to make use of this opportunity to do something more. And it made sense to use this to push this questioning of the technology even further. So to really um, question what this forensic phenotyping technology is doing. 
And so instead of showing just these two faces to represent Chelsea, we decided to show 30. So these are 30 portraits of Chelsea Manning derived from exactly the same DNA, exactly the same data, but read in different ways, showing different probabilities of exactly the same information. So this came from the conversations that we'd been having after the, working on the two portraits of future directions. And then also I would say it was really inspired by Chelsea's writing and her presence on social media with this kind of unrelenting optimism that probably many of you have seen if you uh, follow her on Twitter, for example. So in particular, her insistence on unity across identity categories and encouragement to come together. And so this is a, a quote from uh, the interview that she did in Paper Magazine, actually. And this is kind of the point. She says, there's a coalition that's forming. It's the coalition of humanity. We've been realizing the existence of structural problems in our society for millennia. And it's an incredible leap for humanity to start to break down the automatic factionalism that gender, race, sexuality, and culture have been the basis of. We can see this with all the different vectors that are starting to align with each other in a way that doesn't fit into a one-size-fits-all category. And so for me, the idea was to try to take this approach and this kind of thinking and bring that to the form of the DNA portrait. Break down identity categories and in particular to push against this inscription of identity onto the body from biology and from data and instead to suggest the potential of some kind of molecular solidarity. There are six billion base pairs in the human genome and the vast majority of those we share completely. One of the first uh, bits of Chelsea's DNA that I was studying was her mitochondrial DNA, which is in particular significant because it's passed down matrilinearly. So it comes from her mother and from her mother's mother and so on and so forth. And it is often used to um, estimate someone's genomic ancestry. The interesting thing about Chelsea's mitochondrial DNA, her haplogroup is J, and it's been found in so many different populations around the world. So in the Middle East, in Europe, in the Caucasus, Northeast Africa, Central Asia, and even in ancient Egyptian mummies. And so in a way, it's this kind of part that stands for the whole, that based on this one fragment of DNA alone, it's possible to imagine so many different people that Chelsea could be. And it's this kind of miniature story of kind of the whole piece of everything that we were trying to say with this work. And other of her DNA variations are much the same. I mean, they tell similar stories. So the variant that's associated with her blue eye color, for example, exactly the same variant can be found in totally different populations with different expressed phenotypes. And then maybe the last point um, about the installation um, is that for the first time also I was taking the faces off the wall. So prior to this, I had always exhibited them, as you saw in the slide of Stranger Visions, as this kind of line of heads. And when we started thinking through, I mean, what it would mean to have suddenly 30, I really didn't want it to have this kind of anthropological feeling of covering the walls with heads or this kind of Game of Thrones reference also. <laughs> And so I went through a lot of different iterations thinking about what to do with the heads and finally came to this idea of suspending them together as if they would be standing with Chelsea to kind of evoke this feeling of a crowd or a mass movement, like the movement that had advocated for her release from prison. A kind of coalition. Chelsea's coalition of humanity in a way. So. It's about data, right? So genomic variation is data. Each piece of data is another clue, another possible story. And so as we put together more data, um, there's always different stories we can tell. Some are more probable, some are less probable, but there's never certainty and there are always alternate possible narratives. And that's really what the piece is about, showing a sampling of these al alternate possible narratives that could be told from exactly the same data. And so I just want to um, conclude by kind of returning a bit to the topic of the panel and, and then showing you where I'm going in my next work, um, which is really much more personal. So in thinking about biopower, um, when I 
And thinking recently about biopolitics and biopower, I keep coming back to this uh, quote from Foucault, from an interview Foucault did in 1975, that power would be a fragile thing if its only function were to repress, if it worked only through the mode of censorship, exclusion, blockage, and repression in the manner of a great superego, exercising itself only in a negative way. If, on the contrary, power is strong, this is because, as we're beginning to realize, it produces effects at the level of desire and also at the level of knowledge. And I think we, in uh, academic thinking, and I mean, maybe outside of academia too, when we think about biopolitics, we're so often thinking about knowledge and how, uh, how biopolitics shapes how we know and how we see the world and how we understand truth. But I think it's easy to forget this much more personal and intimate level in which it also configures how we think about ourselves, our identities, and about each other, and the ways that we relate to each other. And so I'm really interested in this kind of biopower configuring our feelings, and our sense of the personal, the bodily, security, secrecy, intimacy, disgust, violation, trust. And so the work that I'm doing now is trying to dig in a little bit more to this kind of personal uh, territory, and and I guess I would say also that I'm increasingly uncomfortable with being put in the position of being asked to perform some kind of expertise. And I would really much rather put my own uh, vulnerabilities and flaws on display. And so the, the project that I'm working on, I'm, I'm gonna share a, a small trailer with you to end my presentation. Um, it's called T3511. And it's a post-genomic love story. It looks at a biohacker who becomes increasingly obsessed with an anonymous donor whose saliva she purchases online. So with that, maybe we, yeah, perfect. Dear donor T2305, I received five milliliters of your saliva in June. It wasn't, hard, it wasn't to get. hard to get. I sent two milliliters of your fluid for sequencing, and then I waited, I waited, I waited. Dear donor, you are 46 years old with dark brown eyes, a full head of brown hair, and few freckles. You toss and turn in bed. You like to run for miles, for hours. And this keeps you slim, heart beating strong, keeps your heart beating and helps strong. tame your sometimes wild thoughts. I imagine your face, your voice, your voice, the way you walk. I worry for your health. I'm curious where you grew and up, and I wonder what you would think of me poring over your genetic detail, detail, details. I'd like to think you would be flattered, but you might, but you might be very angry. Dear donor, on Monday afternoon, I immortalized your cells. You passed cells. your cells 12 times. I infected and you with the simian strong. virus SV to induce replication. replication. Held at the temperature of my body. Your cells want to grow. To grow. grow. Dear donor, on Thursday I uploaded you. Michael Daniels. Michael Daniels. You were born on April 12, 1970. Michael Daniels. In St. Louis, Missouri. I want to write to you, but Michael Daniels, so scared. you live in St. Louis. My letter must have scared you, but I know in person. I've if you saw how much you, much you mean to me, sometimes I feel so close to you, but then St. Louis, you seem Michael Daniels, totally out of reach, totally out of reach. Totally out of reach. <laughs> Michael, I'm coming to St. Louis. A cell is a history. A history. A cell is a home. A cell is a home. A cell is a cage. To break the cell is to trespass the most intimate of spaces.
Hi everyone. It's great to uh, it's great to be here and uh, uh, yeah, it was a really inspiring talk, uh, Heather. Thanks uh, thanks so much. And um, well, we're we're moving on to a very different uh, field, and at the same time, I see a number of uh, a number of connections uh, in in terms of the appropriation of of technologies used for policing. Um, the attempt, at least, or the horizon, maybe, of, of intervening in the world through our, through our work. And, as you say, in a way, uh, even when you're looking at the, the molecular uh, level, actually, uh, you're, you're looking uh, at, at, at the globe or the history of humanity. You were mentioning uh, the way uh, the types of, uh, of DNA could be found in different places and at different times, in fact. So in a way, uh, the kind of uh, the scales and, and, and forms of migration that I'm gonna address are, are already uh, somehow uh, uh, ingrained at the molecular uh, level as well. So, um, so my name is, is Charles. I'm not really sure where to put this uh, laptop. And um, as, as Eric uh, mentioned before, I'm, I'm part of uh, the Forensic Oceanography um, Research Project, which I, I founded with Lorenzo Pizzani in, uh, in, in 2011. And I'm going to you know, say a few words about um, our, our work over these years and uh, the way we've tried to seize upon technologies normally used for the policing of migration to document and contest the violence um, of borders themselves. And I'm sure as you, as you know, the, the deaths of migrants at the maritime frontiers of, of Europe is not uh, a recent phenomena, even though it's acquired a new scale and a new visibility um, in, uh, over the last years. Um, the, the network united um, has documented more than 30,000 deaths at the maritime frontiers of Europe, and we know that there are many undocumented uh, deaths since the, um, the beginning of the 90s. And these deaths are, are fundamentally the, the product of a conflict of mobility, a conflict that opposes the policies of European states and EU institutions that seek to deny access to European territories, to um, populations of the global south, and the reality of the desires and movements of these, these same populations, which are not uh, stopped by policies that deny them legal access, but rather, as a result, are forced to resort to um, clandestine means of migration in, in the etymological sense of the term of, of hiddenness, right? Illegalization leads to clandestine strategies of, of migration and of course, much more precarious um, forms of migration. And so, um, as of the, the turn of the 90s essentially, states started uh, policing the external borders um, of Europe through different patrols. And what you see in you know, kind of a, an image from a, from a Frontex uh, report, the European Border um, Agency that uh, kind of uh, offers an example of these images of migrants' interceptions that we um, all know too, too well. If you zoom into this um, image, you can see that the patrol vessel here, it's an, Ita an Italian patrol vessel, is populated, for example, by radars. So patrol vessels that uh, patrol the, the maritime frontiers of Europe are embedded in a vast surveillance apparatus composed of radars on board those, those vessels themselves, but also coastal radars, AIS vessel tracking data, satellite imagery, and what border controllers try to do is to assemble all of these sources of uh, data into what they call an integrated maritime um, picture. A picture which, despite kind of the, the panoptic tones 
uh, totalizing tones of um, surveillance providers <coughs> is in fact full of, full of gaps uh, and constantly runs up against the limits of resolution and information overload. <coughs> if you give me just a second. Thanks. Now if you look again at this very image, you see that there are not only radars populating this, this ship, but also what we can discern as the, the silhouettes of different actors um, equipped with cameras, certainly the, ca the cameras of border officials, but also of embedded uh, journalists, if you will. And these produce um, images which have become almost inter interchangeable. Actually, effectively, they are. If you, if you simply Google immigrant boat Mediterranean, you'll come across tens of thousands of very similar images. And if you just look at one, you'll see that it appears tens or even hundreds of times, uh, drifting from article to article, often over several um, years. And these uh, images, which show the moment of interception of migrants' vessels by state authorities, in a way, the neutralization of uh, a threat contribute to produce and reproduce what Nicolas de Genova has called the spectacle of borders, through which the, the threat of migration is produced and reproduced in a circular way. If these people are being policed, then they must be a threat. If they are a threat, then we must deploy all, necessarily, all necessary means to police their, their movements. So what I wanted to underline here is the way different media practices from surveillance technologies to um, various forms of imagery are inextricably embedded within um, the violent borders, the violent border regime that we, that we have at work today. They serve to detect and they contribute to the process of uh, securitization. So this was just to try and chart very briefly the field within which we have been trying to, to operate. And essentially what we've been trying to do is to use some of the means of surveillance and use them against the grain, not to detect um, acts of a legalized border crossing, but rather to turn these tools of surveillance against themselves, if you will, and document the violence of borders um, instead. So, our own work of Lorenzo and myself, even though we'd been um, working on issues relating to migration and borders since um, several years before, we started to work collaboratively in 2011, uh, just after the Arab uprisings, first in Tunisia, then in uh, Libya, reopened maritime routes which had been all but closed through the collaboration of um, EU member states and uh, the dictatorial regimes on the southern shore of uh, the Mediterranean. And these, these uprisings allowed to reopen the Mediterranean. At the same time, particularly coming from Libya, they were occurring in extremely precarious conditions. And we were not only seeing uh, uh, an important number of crossings, but uh, a high number of, of deaths. And this occurred in the context um, of the NATO military intervention off the coast of Libya. As you see on the 24th of March 2011, there were more than 38 warships deployed off the coast of Libya, whose mission was both to monitor um, these waters and to, they were used as well to uh, launch um, uh, airstrikes onto, onto Libya that ultimately led to the toppling of the Libyan um, regime. And so um, on the 9th of June 2011, as you see, 
a small French NGO that has been specializing in uh, strategic litigation uh, since a number of years, sent out a press release announcing that it would um, file a legal complaint against NATO, the EU, and all the states taking part in the coalition um, against Libya for failing to assist the migrants in distress. It argued essentially that because of the level of surveillance deployed off uh, the Libyan coast, these actors could not not know. And by failing to respond to these situations of distress, uh, they were guilty of the crime of non-assistance. Now the truth is that um, our, our friends uh, since then, they had absolutely no idea how they were going to um, uh, lead this legal battle. But to a certain extent, their press release um, produced the very reality that they were uh, hoping for. So essentially, Lorenzo Pezzani and myself um, got in touch with this, this organization based on the beginning of a project that was emerging at our Center for Research Architecture in uh, London, the Forensic Architecture Project. And essentially, it was the idea that new forms of uh, use of technologies were being used to document violations. Uh, technologies were being seized um, from the hands of states and used by civilian actors to document uh, and contest their, their, their violations. And so with that, it was the very beginning of that collaborative project, but with the horizon it opened, we thought maybe we can try and help um, this network to uh, document these, these violations at the borders of Europe. And so that's what we essentially set um, off to do. And so what finally the coalition focused on was uh, what is now uh, called the left to die boat case, uh, an incident in which a boat that left the coast of Libya on the 27th of March 2011 was left to drift for 14 days in NATO's maritime surveillance area. And this despite repeated interaction with many different state actors. Um, this, this, the passengers, here we see an interview we conducted with one of the survivors. The passengers sent out a distress call using a satellite phone which was relayed by uh, the Italian Coast Guard to all vessels transiting through the area. And what we did was use the interview and the different initial elements of evidence to try and piece together uh, a coherent picture of the, the overall events. So we, we got in touch with an oceanographer who helped us reconstruct the drift of uh, the drifting boat, if you will, bringing the winds and currents to bear witness to the events, to bear witness to the way, in a, it, paradoxically, they had been made to kill, right? Uh, even though, if, if you will, the, the sea is turned into a deadly liquid by uh, European um, policies of exclusion. And so we, we produced this uh, drift model for its 14 days of drift. And the next question was, well, we know where the boat was located. We know it remained within NATO surveillance area for these 14 days. Where were the 38 warships that you saw at the, the beginning on the, the DOD uh, slide. So what we did was that we purchased um, synthetic aperture radar imagery, essentially satellite imagery produced through radar technology beamed from the, the, the sky. And these images, the images that we could, could acquire have a very low resolution. They have a, they're, they're of a resolution of 75 um, meters. That means that every pixel in, in the image corresponds to 75 pix pixels. So they didn't allow us to actually identify the vessels in vicinity, but it did allow us to say, to say as you see in this image, you have them in, in yellow, this, this yellow patch corresponds to the position of the vessel um, at the time, and 
with these white dots, what you see are the position of large vessels, more than 75 meters, that were um, in vicinity to the migrants' boats. And so, at least it, allows a, it allowed us to produce the, to, to, to pose the question, well, we know your assets were there, which ones were the French, the Italian, the Spanish, the Belgium? Ultimately, we, we produced um, uh, a large report with different re visualizations um, that reconstructed the, uh, the events and tried to assess uh, which actors were responsible for um, the slow deaths of 63 people. Only nine people survived amongst the 72 passengers that had uh, set off 15 days uh, before. And the report that we produced was the basis for several um, legal cases in front of Italy, France, Belgium, and Spain, cases that are ongoing, and the idea, the law takes time, but uh, that these, uh, this coalition, the legal coalition, must exhaust the, the national means of remedy before it can um, demand accountability in front of the European Court of, of Human Rights. Now, after we produced this um, report, we had a great number of people uh, from different organizations come, uh, address us and ask, well, couldn't you help us reconstruct this uh, incident or that incident? And you know, after all, we're just two young researchers in a, in a, in a research center in London and that completely exceeded our, our capacity. So what we tried to do was logically, to hand over the tools that we had begun to uh, develop to exercise a right to look at the maritime frontiers of Europe and try to hand these over to um, civil society on both shores of the, the sea. We, we documented together um, several other cases of uh, non-assistance, in particular uh, an incident on the 11th of October 2013 in, more, in which more than 200 people um, drowned at sea because of another conflict of responsibility between Italy and Malta for the rescue and disembarkation of um, uh, a particular boat in distress. And following this incident, um, members of this network uh, felt increasingly the urgency of not only documenting the violence of past incidents to demand accountability for them, but also trying to intervene in real time to try and prevent the, the constant uh, repetition of similar um, incidents. And that's how um, the Watch the Med alarm phone was, was born, a 24-7 operating um, phone line which is run by uh, more than 100 activists located on bo both shores of the, the sea. And that allows migrants to call this phone line, and this phone line then redirects these calls to activists um, across this, this space. And these can, in turn, pressure state actors into complying with their, their obligations. And this alarm phone uh, network has received several thousand um, calls oh, since October 2014 when the, the project was, was launched. Now, on our end, within the Forensic Oceanography uh, project, we continued as well to try to document the violence of, of borders. However, um, in April 2015, we were confronted with a very disturbing uh, situation. Two large-scale shipwrecks occurred on the 12th and the 14th April 2015. However, these were not the product of practices of non-assistance, which we had grown accustomed to and had documented in the past. Actually, both these shipwrecks occurred at the very moment merchant vessels 
were attempting to rescue the passengers. These were deaths not through practices of non-assistance, but death at the very moment of rescue. However, our you know, constant, um, uh, as, as we, as we uh, you know, observe evolutions at the maritime borders of Europe, we believe this was at least our hy hypothesis when we were faced with these, these situations, that if these cases of deaths were not the product of practices of non-assistance, they were rather the product of the EU's policy of non-assistance, i.e. both these incidents occurred just after Italy and EU member states terminated what had been the Mare Nostrum operation. And so our next report, the Death by Rescue uh, report, involved kind of a, a shift between a forensics of cases that we had focused on in the past to a forensics of policies as well. So what we set out to do in this um, new report was to reconstruct um, the policy shift between the launching and the ending of Mare Nostrum and um, the effects that this, this policy shift um, had. Essentially, as you know, Mare Nostrum was in fact a dramatic break in the way um, state actors had operated. It, it was a radical break in the practices of non-assistance which had dominated um, until then. Um, with Mare Nostrum, which was deployed after uh, the October 2013 shipwrecks, Italian warships patrolled close to the Libyan coast and proactively rescued migrants in distress and brought them back by default to uh, the Italian coast. Cases of non-assistance, conflicts between Italy and Malta, all but disappeared uh, as of the launching of that operation. Now, Mare Nostrum could not bring to an end the deaths of migrants at sea. After, it all, after all, migrants were still forced to resort to smugglers for the first stretch of their journey. But certainly, uh, the continuing deaths at the maritime borders of Europe was not what disturbed European policymakers. Rather, what disturbed them was that Mare Nostrum was also allowing a growing number of migrants to arrive on Italian shores safely and to continue on their way for, as you see, more than half of them towards other um, European uh, countries. And this, this in violation of the Dublin Convention, through which, in principle, the first country of arrival is supposed to uh, be in charge of processing asylum, asylum requests. And so, quickly, Mare Nostrum was accused of being a pull factor and delegitimized um, on, on that ground. And European member states refused to Europeanize the Mare Nostrum operation as uh, Italy had, had requested. And in October, um, in autumn 2014, Mare Nostrum was terminated and not replaced, if you will, by a more limited Frontex-led operation called uh, Triton. As you see, that operation was much more limited spatially, but also did not at all have the proactive um, rescue of migrants as its mission. Rather, its, its, um, its, its logic was that of a defensive logic of uh, border control. Now, from across the board, from um, Amnesty to the UNHCR, even from within Frontex uh, reports, there were warnings that the ending of Mare Nostrum would not lead to less crossings, but only to more deaths. And even the, the International Chamber for Shipping worried that without Mare Nostrum operation in, in place, um, the, the vessels of merchant ships would be uh, put to a greater contribution uh, to rescue um, in the wake of the space 
left vacant by European um, states. And in effect, this is, this is exactly the reality that materialized in the first months of 2015. Uh, the end of Mare Nostrum left a rescue gap, which was partly filled in by unfit merchant vessels. Here is a, a drawing of the collision by one of the survivors of the 18th of April uh, 2015 shipwreck, in, in which more than 800 people drowned. And as you see, their, their boat, uh, which was overloaded by more than 900 people, um, collided with a large cargo ship. Now that cargo ship, which me me measures 177 meters long, had to attempt to rescue the passengers on a completely overcrowded vessel of some 20 uh, meters, extremely unstable, in the middle of the night. And that was effectively um, a predicted and predictable um, catastrophe. And as you see, the ending of Mare Nostrum led to a dramatic increase in deaths, as well as a dramatic increase in um, the mortality rate, i.e. the relation between the number of crossings and uh, the number of deaths. In fact, even the president of the European Co Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, admitted that it was a serious mistake to bring the Mare Nostrum operation to an end. It cost human lives. Now, I don't know about you, but after such a, an admission of guilt, even though we would absolutely contest uh, the term mistake, you cannot qualify of a mistake, a policy that is implemented in full knowledge of its lethal consequences. It's still a, an amazing acknowledgement of guilt. Now, a public policy costs human lives. Now, someone's gonna go to jail. Someone's gonna lose their job. The agency, Frontex, that had been instrumental in pushing for this policy shift over several months, see, in, in this very same speech, sees its budget trebled. So, the EU did not at all re-implement um, a proactive policy of search and rescue, but rather continued its security oriented policies through the, the expansion of Triton, but also the deployment of an anti-smuggling operation. And what happened is that uh, now it was search and rescue um, citizens' initiatives that said, we cannot accept uh, this lethal policy of non-assistance, and, and we will deploy our own vessels, our own civilian vessels, to make up for the lethal gap that you have left um, in, in this wake. And so, since uh, 2015, there have been uh, a growing number of civilian rescue ships that have been doing an absolutely amazing uh, job, um, operating in an extremely professional way, um, what are, again, the most difficult rescue um, operations that you, can, that you can imagine. However, the crossings of uh, the central Mediterranean in particular continued, despite the EU's policies of uh, deterrence. And so, as of the end of 2016, a year that also saw more um, arrivals after, after the closure of the uh, Aegean uh, route. And also after the implementation of what is called the hotspot approach through which uh, the EU has essentially been trying to force um, coastal states to re-implement the Dublin uh, regulation and thus put more pressure on countries such as Italy and Greece. Um, Italy has been implementing a kind of two-pronged strategy in uh, the desperate attempt to 
close off once again um, the central Mediterranean. And that true point strategy is essentially, on the one hand, to delegitimize and criminalize civilian search and rescue, and on the other, to increasingly collaborate with uh, Libyan coast guards to, and militias for them to intercept and bring back physically um, the migrants that had not been deterred by the EU's policies, right? It's really about physically containing migrants on the southern shore of the EU um, that even the EU's lethal policies had not been able to uh, deter. And so what you see is essentially is that um, initially a state-led operation had been uh, delegitimized and terminated, Mare Nostrum, and after that operation was replay, replaced by civil society, now you have a process and a campaign um, of delegitimization and criminalization targeting um, that civilian form of proactive uh, rescue. And so we, we produced this uh, report last summer called Blaming the Rescuers, which, which essentially focuses on um, trying to counter the arguments used um, to delegitimize search and rescue NGOs. We demonstrated, amongst others, that contrary to claims that, despite themselves, the SAR NGOs, search and rescue NGOs, were making the crossing more dangerous, in fact, what you see is that there's uh, an inverse correlation between the number of civilian assets and the danger of crossing, i.e., the more there were civilian vessels deployed at sea, the number of which peaked over, over summer, the least dangerous the crossing um, was. And currently our, our, our research, um, which as, as I'm sure you've understood, kind of operates between academic research, uh, art contexts, and activism, our current research is focusing on producing a counter reconstruction of particular events um, during which the Juventa, uh, the vessel of a German NGO called Jungen Rettet, the Juventa was um, accused of colluding with smugglers. Um, using here, I, I would say in parenthesis, a kind of strategy that I'd like to call factual lies. You take, you take a, a photograph, you take a, a statistical graph, something that has a factness to it, right? A, a strong truth claim. And you, we you weave around this a narrative that is a complete and simple lie. So in this image, which is used in the case against the Juventa, you see it's written in, uh, in Italian, but uh, you see the, the, the Zodiac boat of the Juventa, which has just put uh, life jackets onto a boat which, as you see, is overcrowded with more than 120 people. You have the migrants' vessel here, and here you have what are commonly referred to as engine fishers, i.e. Libyan actors who, even during those rescue operations, are out there trying to take whatever, grab whatever they can from the vessel, in particular the engines, which they can sell uh, after. Now, this actually is extremely common. It happens uh, in the presence of all actors operating rescue at sea, state and uh, civilian. But the co-presence of these actors, which is a fact, uh, in no way indicates any element of collusion, right? It's not because there are engine fishers there that uh, the crew of the Juventa is actively uh, collaborating with them to allow them to uh, recuperate the, the engine, right? So um, our, our, our current work involves producing a counter-reconstruction of uh, these incidents um, within um, the, 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 this court case and trying to counter on this level um, 
the, the criminalization of uh, civilian rescue. On the other hand, to conclude very uh, briefly, we're also working on this other strategy, that of uh, collaboration with the Libyan uh, Coast Guard and trying to document um, several incidents in which um, the Libyan Coast Guard uh, intercepted migrants and brought them back to Libya despite the presence in vicinity of European uh, actors, whether NGOs or in this case military. You see that these are people who are um, intercepted by a Libyan vessel even after they'd been handed over um, life jackets by the Italian Navy. You see the, the insignia of the Italian Navy um, right, right there. And um, so uh, just to, to conclude, in a way, you, you can see that our work um, started by trying to use surveillance technologies against the grain to uh, document violations and demand accountability. It was kind of seized by another tradition um, that which we like to call the underground railway, not to document violations in the past, but support migrants in their unauthorized mobility. And this strategy was extremely effective during what we call the long summer of migration. But in this moment of violent rollback in which uh, states are trying to close off the sea once again, um, we're trying once again to resort to um, new strategies um, to document both cases of violations and the violence of policies to try and contest this rollback um, in, in, the, in its different uh, dimensions. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, we're going to take some questions now, uh, and I think I was told that there's going to be microphones possibly there or there. Um, otherwise, we can just come to the stage if you can't find it. But uh, there we go. Yeah, there. Because um, uh, we still have a good 15, 20 minutes. Um, I was just going to ask a quick one, and I uh, also uh, encourage you both to ask each other questions if, if, if you feel so, uh, so inclined. Um, I think there's a lot of... Uh, stuff here on uh, visibility um, and interrogating visibility, uh, using visibility as a, as a practice of, of activism and saving lives or um, uh, pushing new understandings and interpretations of identity, for instance. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, as, as you said, Heather, and as we see also in the, the many examples you give, uh, uh, Charles, uh, Heather, you said there was like a messy, messy physicalness and we also talked about like uh, the way in which these the part for the whole uh, becomes it can be totalizing uh, and so on. So um, as as people working with visibility, because many many transmedia I've been to, it's often about invisibility. How can we work with invisibility here? Here, I think it's 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 would be nice to hear you just reflect on um, what what are you seeing in relation to things like visibility? What is it like to work with visibility, especially when we have police shootings on Facebook Live, we see so much visibility, we see this violence it, it, at face value. Um, how does that, uh, how do we work with that? Thanks. Yeah, visibility is, is really complicated because on the one hand, um, if it's taken away from you, uh, it completely limits your ability to exist I mean, you ascend, if you don't, I mean, Chelsea said this actually, that um, by taking away her image, she'd basically been made to cease to exist. And then of course, on the other hand, um, visibility also can be perilous. Sometimes you really need to not be seen. Um, and it's fine, I mean, moving between those things and finding a balance between those things is really not easy. And so when it comes to these conversations around kind of the surveillance discourse, it's really tricky. And then let's talk about genomics. I mean, there, there's hardly been any discussion about what visibility and in, in invisibility, anonymity and identity and identifying even means in that context. And so 
definitely I'm hoping with the work to start some of those conversations at least. Um, it's, yeah, it's a very fraught field. But certainly at least with the piece for Chelsea, I think, um, I hope that it tries to bring both of those things forward. I mean, that at least if you see this body of work that um, around DNA and the face, that it begins to show both the way that the technology, this forensic phenotyping technology, can be really oppressive and really uh, scary. And on the other hand, maybe can be harnessed and turned around and used to do something that is liberatory, that does give a visibility to someone who has been censored, which is a theme very much in common, I think, um, in our, between our work. No, actually, I'd, I'd pick up exactly uh, there because to me, um, giving actually not one face but many faces to Chelsea Manning at a time when, as you say, her, her, her own image had been uh, removed and erased is, is a great example in, in, for, for in my own perspective um, of what we would call a disobedient gaze. So for me, it's, it's not so, for us, it's not so much, um, you know, the absolute imperative to either make visible or invisible, but to position oneself um, oppositionally and uh, tactically in a field of, in parenthesis, uh, visibility imposed uh, by states, right? And in a way, uh, the way we try to think of the disobedient gaze and maybe the, the, the left to die boat is, is also uh, kind of uh, exemplary in that sense. It, it involves trying to not make visible what states seek to reveal, and on the contrary, revealing what they seek to conceal, right? So if what states are trying to do is to detect acts of unauthorized migration, all the while keeping their own acts of violations and the violence of their policies uh, in the shadows, our, our aim is exactly to reverse um, that, uh, that, that perspective. Now, what's extremely challenging, I think, is that we're not, um, we're not dealing in a, with a field, uh, with a regime, if you will, an aesthetic regime, in a sense. We're not dealing with an aesthetic regime which is fixed once and for all. So, you know, maybe we, we, could, we could say schematically that uh, <laughs> Uh, states try to keep the deaths of migrants in the shadows while uh, and and show um, their their acts of unauthorized crossings while civil society tries to make those deaths visible and documented right but actually what we see also in the wake of um, of Mare Nostrum in particular is the way uh, deaths themselves have come to be spectacularized by states and used in a way as the justification of their securitized policies. Uh, I often show um, a slide of Emmanuel Barroso, president of the European Commission at the time, standing in front of the coffins of uh, the deaths in the, the 3rd of October shipwreck in uh, Lampedusa in 2013, right? Um, and saying, these deaths are absolutely unacceptable, right? And because they are unacceptable, we have to, once again, uh, increase the budget of Frontex and launch Eurosur, the European surveillance um, uh, system. And so what I want to underline here is that this field of invisibility is constantly shifting, and we constantly have to uh, shift our own strategies, and in that case, precisely what, what is kept in the shadows is no longer so much the death of migrants uh, themselves, but um, the responsibility of EU policies for those deaths. And that's also one of the reasons why in our recent uh, reports we've tried to uh, focus and, and, and make emerge um, that dimension of 
policy violence. It's quite bright here. Is there a question? I can't see. No. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, I have a question. Yes, great. Yeah, I was really curious actually um, a bit on your personal background. What is, how did you come to making this kind of work and um, what were you doing before and sort of what skills you put together to make this happen? Well, I mean, very, uh, very, very briefly, um, I, uh, for me, uh, research, uh, aesthetic practice, and, and activism have kind of been uh, bound together uh, inextricably since I, I started working um, with asylum seekers as a volunteer in 2000. Uh, three, and kind of wanted to understand uh, uh, the condition that I was discovering with them and wanted to try and make visible with them the condition that they were discovering themselves, actually. Um, and so I guess from, from then on, uh, these, these three parts of, of myself uh, have kind of been bound together. And I, I studied uh, arts and then... Um, documentary films, uh, international studies, and then uh, research architecture, which is uh, where, where I completed my, uh, my PhD. And um, I guess that what we, what we try to do, for example, I'm, I've, I'm not a, even though I have kind of a very, very basic tra training in uh, uh, GIS, remote sensing, I'm, I never do, and we never do, Lorenzo or myself, uh, the analysis of satellite imagery or we are not the ones producing the drift model. Rather, we try uh, to understand just enough um, about those technologies um, to be able to s start to think uh, about how we might um, use them uh, productively. I don't know if that answers briefly. There's a question. Hello. Um, I uh, would be interested in, I suppose, your, um, your approach to storytelling in the wider sense, because um, you both deal with activism in very different ways. So one is very broad, very like, broadly political. And then you, Heather, you've got this very personal story of one person that... that you decided to tell. And obviously I, speak, I talk about storytelling, not in the fictional sense, but narrative. Um, and how, so I suppose my question to you is, how do you think that this, this activism that you had with this very personal story, if that, like, how, do, how does that project into a bigger context? And then for you, how personal accounts and how personal stories feed into your work, so I think like this sort of transversal question, does that make sense? <laughs> so I suppose, to just clarify that, so you decided to tell one story of one person, but then obviously you mentioned like very big um, issues, and is there, are there thoughts of like more like broader political acts that you can envision that would come out of your work while you, Charles, maybe have ideas for how personal storytelling can come into what you do? Yeah, um, I think <laughs> with Chelsea, the, the, the original political act, of course, that we wanted happened. <laughs> so that was wonderful uh, when things go that way. Um, yeah, I mean, the act of giving her visibility and, of course, then we're also working um, in my small way on the um, clemency campaign. Um, it's kind of interesting to think about in relation to the new project that I share this bit of with you, so that T3511 came, it's kind of this one little path through this huge body of research that I was doing that kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I started out um, thinking about the story of Henrietta Lacks, um, who was a black woman in 1954, checked into Johns Hopkins Hospital, 
had cells taken from her cervix that then became used without her consent and without the consent of her family to form the first ever immortalized cell line, the HeLa cells. And uh, it's the subject of a bestseller, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, also a, a film with Oprah even. Um, so it's a, a story that's become a big story, I would say, a fairly well-known story as these stories go. Um, but it's one instance of this incredibly commonplace practice. So I was wondering what that landscape looked like, really, the landscape of biological commodification. And then I started thinking, how does this relate to the research that um, Yaniv Ehrlich was doing? So he's a scientist who was looking at re-identification from supposedly anonymous DNA samples, and he showed that it was really quite straightforward to make guesses about some, what someone's last name might be based on their DNA data, based on Y-chromosome data in particular, so this genetic male um, DNA data. And if you put those two things together, and if you think that we're, I mean, and this is in a U.S. context, I should be clear, but it's not just in the U.S., that we're living in a society in which pe bits and pieces of people's bodies are always being recommodified without their knowledge and put out there in the world as products, and that it's so trivial, actually, to re-identify them and figure out who they are. And is only getting easier, of course, as the technology advances. What does that world look like? I mean, so that's the kind of the question that, is, um, that inspired the um, T3501 piece. But as I started digging into that research, it just became bigger and bigger and bigger. So it started with thinking about these kind of s hospital scraps but then I realized that there were so many um, of these places that were commodifying and then um, reselling and repackaging um, various body fluids and cells and bits of body parts. I mean, all of these things. It, I, it started filling my wall with this kind of map of what this looked like. And so... At first, I had been thinking I needed to do a documentary to really show the, every, all of it, but then I thought it's just too big, and I need to find just one story through this material, and maybe the story is actually this true story, in a way, a mostly true story, about indeed this bottle of saliva that I bought, and indeed this person whose DNA I sp spent time with, who is also, in a way, Chelsea Manning, is, it's this saliva stranger, it's Chelsea Manning, and then of course it's also all of the people that I had relationships with and things, I mean, bundled together into this um, projection of a character onto this data and onto these cells. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> hey, I have a uh, question for Heather. <laughs> Sorry, is it Heather or Heather? Um, <laughs> but did you want to answer? She had a question for him. I, I don't mind. I can, I can answer very briefly. I mean, since you were already you also, uh, also asking me, but I'll be, I'll be very brief. I'd say um, one, uh, as, you, as you saw, in fact, from, from the presentation, I mean, uh, all of our investigations start actually from, from uh, uh, the basis of uh, survivors' uh, testimonies. Um, and what we try to do is corroborate their, their account of events with multiple other sources of, of, uh, of evidence. And what we try to do in, uh, in our reports to some extent, but also in our, in our videos in particular, um, liquid traces or death by rescue, is to try and combine these different perspectives, if you will, uh, to, to keep together an in intention in a way uh, the view from the boat and the view from, from the sky, right? Um, and uh, this is something that I think has been important for us, Ki kind of try to uh, keep, again, together and in tension um, different scales of experience. And uh, one of the things that inter that's interesting for us right now and also challenging is um, to think of ways to combine also uh, different temporalities. So for example, I'm very interested by uh, the, the, the installation of camps here uh, 
that combines the presence and past temporalities in a really um, interesting way. All right. Um, you talked about the community, like the communal lab that was uh, in your in your city. I kind of forgot where it was. Sorry. Gen Space in downtown right. Brooklyn. Cool. Um, which had me thinking, like this is something that I had never heard of before. Like, are there any like stories that come from this like space that is like uh, publicly available to people who might have never had access to such equipment before? Like, did you encounter any of these stories? That, that uh... yeah, that's a very nice question. Um, yeah, so GenSpace started, um, I think, in two thousand thirteen, if I'm not mistaken, around then anyway. Um, or yeah, and. Since then, so many of these have popped up all over the world. And so it really became a global movement. Um, there are some kind of DIY biohacking things happening even in Berlin. The, the German regulations around these things are much stricter than in the US, as you might imagine. And so um, it makes it not quite as easy to open up a community lab here. But there are really many in Europe, I mean, in London, in Paris, um, and then many, many in the US. Um, GenSpace, for me, I mean, telling the stories of GenSpace would be very interesting. Um, it's really a place, I think it's one of the most interesting face-to-face -face communities that I've been involved with, and one of the most interesting communities I've been involved with, period, um, certainly in recent years, and is so because it really brings together such a diverse group of people from all different interests and age groups and all over the city. Um, students to retired people um, who are working. I mean, some of them, definitely, there's a bunch of artists there, but it's certainly not remotely all artists. I mean, lots of students and entrepreneurs and scientists who want to work on side, product, side projects and um, all kinds of other hobbyists and things. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I would have to think a bit more about pulling out some of the compelling stories from that, but I mean, the story... <laughs> for me was that it enabled me to make this work that would have been totally impossible otherwise. Hi, I, just, uh, I just wanted to ask at the beginning, you mentioned that um, you were wanting to look more at like disgust and various emotions and then you said in personal stories. Um, was that in regard to your own personal stories or in terms of surveillance of um, emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm interested in looking at how biopower is shaping our f feelings around this, our feeling, for example, of disgust. I mean, so think that's sort of leading into this video project and thinking about saliva, for example, and thinking about sort of being attracted to someone's saliva and what is, um, yeah, what is attractive or repulsive, and then data and sort of can you be seduced by someone's data? And kind of these, these kind of questions. I mean, I can't, I'm still in the midst of working on this project and I can't at all say that I've figured it out, but it's a territory that I'm really interested in exploring this year, I guess I would say, um, in that work and that I'm hoping that that work will convey and, and allow an audience to enter into kind of thinking through some of those questions also of why it is that you are attracted or repulsed or trust or don't trust or um, identify with a character or don't. Just tell us when we're out of time, but here we have one at the front. Yeah, uh, first I want to say uh, fantastic projects. I, I, I really like uh, both of them and, and, and think they're really inspiring, but my question is uh, you sort of both work with, especially with the Chelsea Manning thing, of course, you, you, you both work with the very political um, issues. Uh, and of course, that goes back to also to the question of what's you know, vis visualization, what should be visible and what shouldn't. But my question is more, uh, and, and you also sort of commented a bit on this, but, but, but I'm really interested in how you how you how you think of positioning your work, uh, and whether you worry uh, if if you if you end up uh, on on the, on the right track politically, because of course uh, you know we we've all read our 
uh, Roland Barthes or whatever, that, that, uh, that artistic work, that the artist doesn't control the work. So in what sense do you, and, and, and you, you both position you, as I hear it very sort of, uh, you think a lot about how you position your work. Uh, so I, I was, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, yeah, in, in how, you, how you think about this positioning the work and, 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 and whether whether it, it, it would end up being sort of misused in some sense, which I guess is a high risk working in these areas. In fact, um, this, this has been and certainly remains uh, a central question for me. Um, actually, from 2007 to 2011, um, I stopped producing images of migration. Uh, after I came across um, an information campaign in quotation marks uh, produced by the International Organization for Migration and funded by uh, Switzerland, I'm, I'm a Swiss citizen, um, in which they were producing a fictionalized representation of migrants' precarious condition in an unidentified European city, something very close to images I had produced myself in a more documentary uh, format. But of course, they were not doing this to denounce uh, European policies that precaritize uh, migrants, but rather uh, they were trying to deter potential migrants, right? This was part of what they, they actually labeled themselves um, campaigns of perception management. So from that time, from that encounter of uh, uh, this, this information campaign, I, I kind of made a pause in producing images of migration and tried to rather uh, reflect on the migration of images themselves and on this particular uh, form of media governmentality. And, um, well, I think that uh, essentially a lesson I take from, from this and that continues to uh, inform certainly my, my practice is that we're, we're in an imminent field. Uh, so it's, it's an imminent field and it's a confl conflictual field. So we can, they can seize from us, as I just mentioned, but we can also use satellite imagery uh, against the grain, right? Uh, right, right now, uh, an instance that is making us think as well, I mean, about these issues, is the use of uh, AIS vessel tracking data. Uh, we used, the, initially it's a, it's a collision avoidance technology used to smoothen global logistics, if you will. Uh, but it's also used for monitoring and surveillance uh, purposes. Now we used it to reconstruct uh, cases of violations, some of which you, you saw when you see these tracks, uh, different tracks of color, this, this is uh, vessel tracking data. Now, um, however, we're not the only ones who can seize upon technologies. Uh, since 2016, the far right has been using these technologies to den denounce the so-called collusion of uh, civil society fleets with the smugglers, right? So uh, using very, very similar methods and forms of narrative, actually, uh, at, that, uh, that we had in the past. Now again, it's, it's, a, it's an imminent field of constant appropriation and reappropriation. And last summer, when uh, the identitarian far right chartered what is called the Sea Star, a vessel which they were trying to use to monitor and block civilian rescue uh, activities, actually activists from both shores of the, the, the sea used the AAS track of the Sea Star, which it is mandated to uh, emit, right? To block the Sea Star from docking in any port uh, of the Mediterranean, right? So again, it's, it's, a, it's an imminent field and a field of conflict and we're not immune to, to reappropriation. Um, I guess the only, the only attempt that we can do is, is to uh, be aware of, of this you know, moving field and try to develop kind of a, a critical analytics of the, te of the technologies uh, we use. Yeah, I totally agree. 
Um, I would say I really worried about that a lot uh, in 2012, 2013, when I was working on Stranger Visions, for multiple reasons. I mean, one, um, because it was so, I was blanketed, uh, I was sort of blanketed by requests from the media, and so it was um, on the, all, all, all the major news outlets and so forth, and so of course I was very concerned about how it would be represented, how the work would be represented, or how I would represent myself even with no um, experience in talking, I mean, publicly about anything. And then because what that led to was getting requests from the police, which is, I mean, that's about as direct as it gets. And then having to try to figure out what my, where my ethical boundaries were around the work. And I mean, getting requests that really would make you cry to read, um, to help with unidentified remains, for example. Alongside getting requests from the Moscow police to catch a serial rapist, for example. And it's really not easy to figure out what to do about these things. And ultimately, I didn't um, work with the police on any of these things, but um, in some cases, I won't say that I was not tempted. And it, I think, also gets at this boundary around sort of what a technology is and when there might be aspects of it that can still be used for purposes that are good, even if the technology itself is dangerous, that there are these elements that you can pull out. And so, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really very murky and very difficult territory. And I think you can always be, have your, your work be reappropriated. And I mean, it's art after all. I mean, we put it out there and then you all take away something different anyway. So of course, people are going to take away things that are the opposite of what you want along with the things that you really hope that they, that they get. But I will say that after working on that and um, all of the sleepless nights that came from that, that project, I think th that my work since then has tried to defy that a bit more. So I think it's a bit harder actually with uh, probably Chelsea to reappropriate it in that way. But I, I'm sure it's still possible. <laughs> Um, I, I th these, these seats that you're sitting on look extremely uncomfortable, so I think we've, we've, we'll, st we'll stop there. But um, I mean, it was really exciting to see these two different practices, and I think it's still seeping into me. It's very kind of, um, I like how instructive, but also uh, inspiring it's been. And uh, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Heather. And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us.